Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, this is a far less critical talk than yesterday of Crossref. Uh, I was told to do that yesterday. It was not just me being mean. Um, a bit of background. I am actually an English literature senior lecturer at Birkbeck University of London. So that's the equivalent of a tenured associate professor in, in the US system. Um, I write books about contemporary fiction and journal articles about contemporary fiction. Um, I work in that space for one half of what I do. The other half of what I do is that I used to be a computer programmer. I still am a computer programmer. Um, I'm not going to talk much about technology today, though. Um, but I'm also very interested in scholarly communications, the way that system has evolved over time, what the different economic and social constraints are on different disciplinary fields of practice, and how our actions in the present are conditioned by decisions made long ago. And so what's really interesting here is if you think about the London Underground train system, those of you familiar with it, um, it's hell on earth in the summer. It's boiling hot. It's awful to travel on. It's overcrowded. And that's not because we wouldn't put air conditioning in there for some technical reason in the present. It's because when the Victorians designed that system, they thought, well, we're only going to need you know, a maximum of X number of people traveling on this system every day, and um, we're going to run steam trains under there, so we need it at this gauge. And they didn't think someone might put air conditioning units in there later because air conditioning didn't exist. So that's just a great example. It's Jaron Lanier who actually flags that up of how historical situations constrain our technical decisions in the present. And you can come up with as many brilliant technical answers as you like. Those social situations, those decisions condition what is technically possible in almost every circumstance. And so what I'm going to do today is talk about the humanities disciplines, where I come from. I'm going to talk about what the different economic and social conditions look like there. And I'm going to do that via a detour outside of our little niche world where we talk about DOIs and event tracking and citation metrics and so forth. And I'm going to go back to the origins of why we're doing this. Why are we reading and writing? Even why are we doing, applying computational methods to this body of literature? What is the actual mission, regardless of organization type, that we're trying to pursue here and what do we want from this system? And I'm then going to look at some of the practical challenges we face in identifying transitions towards open access modes of publication in these disciplines. And I really mean, back to the beginning, why do we read, why do we publish, sorry? We publish for two reasons as academics. We publish to read, to be read, um, to communicate work at distance, obviously. But I think, more importantly, if we think about why people behave how they do, we publish because we are assessed via publication. Now, that sounds straightforward. We need to see what people are producing. We want advances. But what's really interesting about this system is that it privileges the act of speaking and writing infinitely more than it publishes reading in any sense. There is no metric of any research assessment framework anywhere or any funder that says, show me how much you've read and we'll reward you for that. It says, show me how much you've produced and we will reward you for that. So researchers become these split personality beings where when I'm writing, I say it's because I want to be read, I want people to read me. Um, but when I'm thinking about being assessed, it's I'm producing because I want to be uh, measured by this system because that's how it leads to personal gain, etc., etc. So when we think about the altruistic side of what we're doing here, talking about dissemination, we can break this down into a few aspects. Quality control, validation, and space-time compression. Dissemination of work is obviously key to this. Um, if you ask any humanities researcher, they won't usually talk so much about the assessment side of it. They'll come out with noble goals in the liberal humanist tradition about critical thinking in society. We produce this stuff because we want to do good in the world. And it's brilliant that people do think like that, but I think it's a naive assessment of how we behave. We also know, particularly at this meeting, that we want a record to be preserved. We don't want those black holes of the preservation record where we can only guess what's going on. As Anthony Grafton puts it in his excellent History of the Footnotes, that I recommend everyone should read, actually, highly entertaining cultural history, he points out that footnotes are the only link we have to the claims of truth of the past in the scholarly record. They are what we use for a genealogy of validation of truth in the present, particularly relevant, I think, to this group here today. I have some questions about whether footnotes function differently in different spaces. All we do know, though, is that they're not actually just always a straightforward uh, validation chain. 
There is actually an ontology of citation types that's been created that breaks down into 83, I think, different ways in which citations are used, from disputes through to agrees with, through to builds upon, etc. Those types of terms that circle around how we're using this system of interrelation. So it's actually quite a complex uh, network that we're building here. To pick up on one of Jeff's favorite phrases, though, what we also want from this system is a way to avoid reading. And I suspect some of you have heard uh, Jeff Builder tell this anecdote before, but I'm going to appropriate it because I love it so much, um, but all credit to him for this. If you watch academics in a bookshop, you know they're academics for one reason. They pick the book off the shelf and they go straight to the back. And they're saying, am I cited? Are my friends cited? Does this person know what they talk about, where I am the pinnacle of excellence and I will judge them from my perspective of whether they really know this field? Um, they might then look at the index as well, which is a kind of strange alternative topographical map of a text. It's like the map versus the territory. And writing a book, it's a really strange experience when your work is indexed, by the way, or when you index it and see that, because it's both familiar and uh, estranged and deformed from what you produced when you're immersed in writing a book. Um, and then, basically, what the academics are doing here is working out, I only have limited time to read. I need signals from a work that show me whether this is worth my time. And I'll come back to different contexts we used there, but actually, an economy of labor time lies behind a lot of the signals that we want from a scholarly communication system. Now, that has uh, pernicious knock-on effects in many different spaces that I'll come on to, but fundamentally... I can't read every book that is published, even in my niche subfield or every article. So computational methods is one way we might scan a vast body of literature to which we can't pay total attention, but we can also only read in detail a limited quantity of this material. How do we know where to invest our time? I don't know, if, by the way, someone, if anyone knows this in the break, does anyone know when the discourse of spending time and investing time came about? I'd be really interested about that financialization of our time in an economy of labor. That's just an interesting side point. We also know that we keep claiming that the internet and scholarly publishing now gives us this ability to reach out a great distance. It no longer takes weeks to post things across the Atlantic. Um, it just takes horrendous flights um, and jet lag um, to get there if you still want to do that. Um, but we claim that these new systems will actually reduce uh, the travel and the time lag there. But yet, it's notable that everyone here has convened in this room today. We're talking about digital technologies all the time, but nothing beats a face-to-face -face interaction, even in this day and age. So we sometimes over-talk the utopian potential that we get, and academics from my home country are all flying to Boston today for the Modernist Studies Association conference. Um, it seems that we haven't yet replaced that kind of interaction. Maybe we never want to. That was a dissemination kind of field. But this is an assessment field of what a symbolic economy looks like for academics. And I think it explains a lot about academic behavior. Researchers function within a symbolic economy. And what I mean by this is that most researchers do not make a living from having to sell their research outputs. And that's interesting and important. It's important because it allows the pursuit of knowledge that is not market viable. And that's important because we know that actually if you only invest in short-term research that will pay off for shareholders in the present, you're unlikely to get the cumulative advances in humankind that we want, whether that's in the study of history or uh, genetics. It doesn't matter. We want people to be free to investigate things that we don't know about their value in the present. And so we actually trust people a lot here. We get people to prove their worth in the academy, and then in a tenure system, we give them the freedom to investigate what they want and the salary is kind of a patronage system, the last available patronage system in the world where people are free to give away their work. And this works kind of like a symbolic economy, though, because although researchers don't sell their work, they are assessed by it. And that assessment leads to their ability to get tenure, to get a job, to get a promotion, etc. And the people who sit on those assessment panels suffer from the same lack of labor time as the rest of us. They can't read the 300 books that are in front of them from a panel of people applying. And that's the kind of ratio in my field that we get. For every post we advertise, we have 300 people applying, all with books and articles. Often they're in a subject area that we're not familiar with either. After all, if we want to hire a medievalist, we're doing that because we have a deficiency of medievalist expertise in our department. So there's no way, even if we read it often, we could be sure that it was good work. We just have to hope. 
And so we start to use kind of proxy measures for this. Um, in scientific fields, the impact factor is a well-known uh, journal brand type measure. In my field, it's much less formalized, but there is still this kind of inside knowledge, a type of old boys club. You know where you should be publishing because that will function as a signal that you got through a difficult process to get this published. And if this system worked perfectly from that perspective, what you'd see is that the venues that we use would have a 1 in 300 ratio of you can get published here. For every 300 submissions, you'd only see one paper published. And then these economies would map perfectly, and you could use that as a precise proxy, although we might query what that exclusion process looks like. And that then, as you can see in this loop, translates back into a salary for the researcher. Even though they weren't paid for it, these things are basically a currency. And I find that really interesting. The symbolic economy, though, maps onto a real economy with which I suspect most people in this room will be far more familiar. And this is a strange kind of looped market environment that doesn't look like many other markets in the world. So researchers, as we said, are free to give away their work, and that's great. But they need the labor time of publishers. They need the services that are provided. And that's wholly sensible. Um, a lot of people think that I, I'm one of those people who magics away the labor time and efforts of publishers. Um, but actually, with a technological background and a social background here, I know full well of typesetting, copy editing, proofreading, platform maintenance, digital preservation, marketing, editorial oversight, peer review, etc. actually take a huge amount of time. And it really interestingly, actually, most of the people I speak with don't get how big a cost marketing is for any type of publisher. How much it costs to get people to give you money to do good things is quite amazing, actually, um, when you first come to that. So we gave researchers freedom, and then we didn't give it to publishers. What we said to publishers was, you will be dependent upon a strange kind of closed-loop market system to recover your costs and make any surplus or profit that you require. However, we also know that the primary customers of scholarly publishers are academic libraries, of which there are a limited number. And academic libraries are acting on the instruction of their researchers as to what material they should purchase for teaching and research um, reasons. But researchers have approximately zero price sensitivity in this system. I have only heard one researcher ever say to me, I didn't publish in that journal because I know it costs my library too much and my colleagues down the road can't afford it. So researchers are operating in the symbolic economy, libraries are acting under their instruction in the real economy, and this leads to a very odd environment. Furthermore, research articles and books are not substitutable goods in the traditional competitive sense that you'd expect in a market. I can't say, I don't have access to that article, I'll read that one instead. Because we made uniqueness and originality a criterion of publication. So they're kind of, uh, as Peter Subers described it, micro-monopolistic commodity goods. Where we do see a market is in publisher service provision. Different publishers make often very valid claims to do things better um, or with relative different degrees of value compared to other players. But who are their clients? Is it the reader or is it the author? Is that split personality again? I've heard publishers say to me, our clients are our authors and we provide services to them like copy editing. But I'd say, hang on a minute, copy editing, that's a service for the reader to make this thing intelligible and to get around the fact that lots of academics think they can write and they can't. Um, so there's something odd going on with this where libraries are purchasing but they're not often deemed the clients. Sometimes they are the clients when you're uh, integrating with their technical, technical systems. But a quite a weird system that doesn't look like many other markets I've ever seen. And what this strikes me as pointing to is the fact that reading and assessment seem to sit in conflict here. We have this drive to produce ever more work, privileging the right to speak over the right to read. We've got this problem of hyperinflationary price increases caused by this massive expansion of publication volume, meaning that no library has access to everything its researchers uh, might need or its students. And so for this assessment paradigm to work, we've created a very odd flow. And we might also think about the link to teaching here. The volume of research we, produced, we produce is linked to how many students we recruit at institutions because we're funded in many systems by tuition fees. And that's what we can hire our staff off. 
So this ecosystem gets incredibly complex and interrelated, and research and teaching really can't be easily divorced from one another in that economic sense. This is the uh, high point or low point, depending on how you look at it, and the philosophical abstract side of this talk. It gets a bit more concrete later, but bear with me. What we're starting to see is a shift in expectations that has been going on for nearly a century around the reproducibility of artifacts. I'm not talking about reproducibility of scientific method here. I'm talking about the fact that we can make copies of things that are entirely lossless. They are identical to the original in our day and age. And this shifts what people think about the production of artifacts like books and journal articles. And we see a lot of discourse that claims that all the costs evaporate. So a really good example of this is in the UK with e-books versus traditional books. We don't have value-added tax on traditional books, but we do on e-books. So often, an e-book costs more than a print book. And people can't get their head around this. They think, but I'm not receiving anything of a physical nature that kind of should carry the heft of the cost with it. But of course, the costs never were for the bulk part in producing that artifact, at least not since print on demand. They were in the labor to first copy. Once you get to first copy, most of your costs are done. But we've got this disjunct of uh, what we expect in the digital age. And I think this is because the artificial economy there is starting to be undermined by this reproducibility. So some quotes here from the early 20th century. Paul Valery noted in 1931 that our fine arts were developed. Their types and uses were established in times very different from the present. By men, and it was always men, I'm afraid, at that point, uh, whose powers of action upon things was insignificant in comparison with ours. But the amazing growth of our techniques, the adaptability and precision they have obtained, the ideas and habits they are creating, make it a certainty that profound changes are impending in the ancient craft of the beautiful. He's talking here about art, but this is 1931. It could apply to lots of thinking about scholarly communications today. In all the arts, there is a physical component which can no longer be considered or treated as it used to be, which cannot remain unaffected by our modern knowledge and power. For the last 20 years, in 1931, matter, neither matter nor space nor time has been what it was from time immemorial. We must expect great innovations to transform the entire technique of the arts, thereby affecting artistic invention and perhaps even bringing about an amazing change in our very notion of art. How far away from our utopian discourses around the potential of scholarly communications in the digital age does that sound? Not very far is my contention. Then we have a very famous passage from Walter Benjamin, a philosopher um, in the 1930s in his work, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. Benjamin says, in principle, a work of art or read um, journal article or book has always been reproducible. Man-made artifacts could always be imitated by men. But around 1900, technical reproduction had reached a standard that not only permitted it to reproduce all transmitted works of art and thus to cause the most profound change in their impact upon the public, it also had captured a place of its own among artistic processes. Even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element, its presence in time and space, its unique existence, the place where it happens to be. And this is the kind of disjunct we see to this day, um, 100 years later almost. Still not there. And finally, a very different quotation from Jaron Lanier's book, You Are Not a Gadget, in 2010. And I think this nails the kind of thinking we're having to combat and why I keep talking about labor time in publishing rather than technology or processes. The problem in each case, um, he's talking about theft specifically in the digital world here, but in the digital world, is not you stole from a specific person, but that you undermine the artificial scarcities that allow the economy to function. So when we put DRM on things, when we're putting paywalls on things, what we're frantically trying to do is to recover the fact that the digital allows this instant copying, and it's not like theft where it's taken away from the original person. We're trying to make a one-to-one -one economy map to that previous environment of print scarcity because it's the only way it will match onto our economic thinking in the present. But it's under threat as we speak. So I'm going to talk now from a university perspective about the problems we face at the moment in the humanities disciplines as a result of many of these ongoing processes. I'm going to talk about researcher access, 
public access and reuse. Now, I've just put a kind of a back reference to my initial um, cyclical chart, C under cereals crisis. I'm sure we're all sick of discussing this kind of thing, the 300% rise above inflation since the 1986 figure for collection budgets um, at universities, et cetera, et cetera. I'll just add from a humanities perspective that it's a bit weird, though, because in the humanities, our absolute costs for journal purchasing are much, much lower than in the sciences, make up only a fraction of the total cost. But we have seen the same proportionate rise in necessary expenditure for all subscriptions since 1986. So in relative terms, it goes up the same as the sciences, in absolute terms, much lower. But also, this implies that the humanities budget is completely under the influence of scientific expenditure. Governments around the world, funding agencies, are prioritizing scientific disciplines. And I'm, I don't want to get into discourses of humanities versus sciences because I need hospital treatment every month and I benefit hugely from what the sciences do. I know lots of uh, scientists who are very interested in history and literature. Um, these are divisions made politically outside of the academy, is my experience. But what I am saying is that with that kind of prioritization comes unique challenges for publishers in the humanities space because your budget will be sequestered by scientific budgets under that kind of strategic priority. And so the pot becomes smaller, competition becomes more intense, even while researchers are being enjoined to create more and more research as they go on. So very strange kind of economic time for humanities publishers, I think. The second problem is one of public access. And this comes back to that political point. The humanities continue to uh, defend their existence on the basis of this critical thinking that I talked about earlier. Critical thinking in a democratic society, we say. Um, well, I'm not quite sure how this can be the case at the moment. Because what we have is a situation where people are coming to us for three or four year degrees to defer employment and incur debt. An incredible amount of debt. By all accounts, they enjoy the access to the scholarly literature in which we train them while they're under our auspices, but we then deny it to them when they leave the academy. Um, is critical thinking something you just get at some point in your life and then you, you don't need to do it, you can just go off and do your job and never come back to? No, I think if we're claiming that, we need to make sure that people more broadly have access to the scholarly literature. We might ask what a university is for in that kind of case, and there are various answers to that. What are the humanities for? Well, some people don't think they're for anything. Um, and that's fine, I might agree with that, um, but for different reasons. But I do worry that actually with an increasingly educated populace who are capable of reading this material, we run the risk of them not seeing the university as part of society, and therefore, why should it be funded in any sense? It becomes a private enterprise, and we lose that kind of freedom to investigate things that was core to the produ production of knowledge that I talked about at the beginning. We also have the problem, though, of restrictive reuse rights, even within the academy. Um, I've never quite got my head around the copyright clearance center type photocopying licenses when we've subscribed to something for teaching purposes, um, CCA, I think we have in the UK. Um, there's something strange that jars about that process of paying for reproduction. Again, it's an issue of copying, though, undermining a scarcity function. We have the problem of text mining and derivatives being prohibited in certain jurisdictions without open licensing. So actually, um, because I used to be a programmer, I do a lot of digital humanities work. I'm actually working on a project at the moment, a book-length project, that has a chapter that looks at campus novels through history, actually, from the 1950s onwards, and plots what's called the kernel den density estimation function of linguistic terms around the university. So how many terms about the university appear over these novels in time? This is a complete digression, but I'm, I like it, so I'm going to talk about it. Um, and what you see is in 1950s campus novels, you have real spikes in terms like university, lecturer, professor, at the beginning and end with a dip in the middle. And that's because the structure of those novels is um, set up the university as an environment. The professor has some kind of period of exile or disgrace where he's away from the university and finds something out about himself. And then at the end, either the university is a site of parody, so it's once more inscribed in the text, or he, goes back, he or she goes back to the university and is within it again. Later campus novels don't do that. They have massive, uh, constant variants throughout of these terms. They're dense, densely packed with them in a kind of literary ex exhaustion type way. And then I'm looking at a very different type of novel. But basically, I had to get access to that corpus to do that kind of work. And in the UK, we have an exemption that the right to read is the right to text mine things. But that's not the case worldwide. And we have this problem 
of increasing the use of computational methods, even in humanities fields, and not having access to the scholarly literature to mine it is also a problem there, as I think um, Scott's been talking about in, in his talk just now. We've also heard um, from Jeff how important Wikipedia is to the public presence of our disciplines. The fifth largest referrer is somewhere unaffiliated with the academy, nominally having very little access to the literature, but that is driving traffic to our publications. If we value reading as an activity, Wikipedia seems to be a place that people are coming to actually read this rather than just produce this work. So I think working out how we get work openly licensed and get it into Wikisource so it can be transcribed into Wikipedia so it can drive traffic back to publishers' sites, um, so the gateway drug to the real stuff. Um, it's a bit pejorative, I guess, to call ourselves drug uh, dealers in some way. But um, what I'm saying there is thinking about the benefits to publishers and academics of those click-throughs, those resolutions from Wikipedia, and how you get your content cited there. It's through open licensing and open availability. And lastly, we've had this discourse in the humanities, in particular of post-colonialism, for about 50 years now, critiquing mostly the legacies of my country and its damaging imperial ambitions in the 19th and 20th centuries. But we still have a situation where English is the dominant language of scholarly communications, and we have problems of a global divide, as one was talking about earlier. This is actually where the problem of predatory publishing comes from. It's a desire for, for those outside the global northern system of higher education to buy into the system of cultural prestige that exists there, not realizing that not all journals are created equal and not all processes are there to help academics with either reading or publishing. And so I think working out how open licensing can facilitate translation, even where there isn't a market to pay for professional translation, might be a really interesting thing to consider. Publishing, as a term, seems to me more affiliated in the mind of researchers with credentialism. What about thinking about communication in what we do, including communication across national and linguistic boundaries? And so this is my slide where everyone probably knows all the jargonistic terms, but it's worth talking about because I'm going to talk about business models for open access very soon. And there's often some confusion around where these terms sit. Open access refers to peer-reviewed research, so we're not talking about cat videos and low, lowering quality barriers here, that is free to read and reuse to some extent online. And where I think the biggest confusion has popped up here is with respect to gold and green open access. It's a rare that a month goes by where I don't read a piece that says that gold open access is about article processing charges and involves a payment to the publisher. That's not the definition of open access as it's ever been conceived by any formal statement. Gold open access means the publisher does it. It means they need a different model, most likely, because why would people pay, especially in a journal environment, um, for something they can get for free? Although that's different for books, actually, that I'll talk about shortly. On the other hand, green open access refers to institutional or subject repository deposits by researchers. And green is really interesting because there are various narratives you can chart around it. You can say it's great because at the moment there's no evidence that green causes subscription cancellations from various studies of librarians. And we found in the UK that 96% uh, of journal articles submitted to our national assessment exercise in a four-year period could have been made green open access within the terms we now have for a mandate. So publishers are saying, you know, actually, we don't have any evidence this is going to damage us. If it'll keep you happy, go for it. It'll probably increase the traffic through to the original. It might help with that Wikipedia phenomenon. And that's great. But it does mean that it's dependent upon that existing business model that I think is coming under threat from the cognitive disjunct between the digital environment, infinite reproducibility, and where our costs lie. So we've got some challenges there. Some would say this current system is unsustainable for universities, in which case, in their rhetoric, green is resting on an unsustainable paradigm. And then we have some terms about permissions. I think uh, Scott said so much about permissions and the benefits we get from it. I'm not going to go into that. But thinking about whether your work is just free to read, whether it's free to reuse, is important. The history of open access is, of course, one dominated by scientific discourses. You can actually trace it back to software development paradigms, I think, for open licensing with Richard Stallman and the GPL. Um, Larry Lessig takes that, though, and applies it more broadly to cultural phenomenon. Lessig thinks that great poets steal that actually all work is built upon a legacy of others and part of a network of interconnected collaborative uh, production. And so he says, well, let's think about how we can apply open licenses to work in 
creative disciplines, creative fields as well. And throughout this, you know, the first sub-institutional mandate is Southampton Computer Science Department. High energy physics has massive take up of green open access deposit and preprints. There's strong scientific imperative here. But science isn't one space. Chemists are not particularly good at green open access, for example. In fact, they're comparable to philosophy in recent studies I've seen. So it's another false divide there. And we also know that there is a history of the humanities throughout this movement as well. Peter Suber, who drafted the uh, Budapest Declaration on Open Access, is a philosopher of epistemology and ethics, now at Harvard School of Communications, obviously. We also know that humanists now, when they go to do projects themselves, inherently go for open and digital. If they're doing something online, they don't see any point in having a paywall. They went there because they wanted that infinite dissemination. Now, that often means they don't have a sustainability model or any kind of business plan behind it, and you can criticize it on that front. But what it does show is there's not an incompatibility with thinking about open access and what's done in the humanities. There are people who want that reach as much as in the sciences where the arguments about you know, people die if they don't get medical research, etc., are brought up. Nobody's died because they haven't read my literary criticism, by the way, um, although it might happen, so you should get going on that. Um. <laughs> but article processing charges are intensely problematic in the humanities disciplines for a range of reasons. Article processing charges are not inherently a bad idea. They are the logical first business model that I think anyone would turn to if they were not able to sell work. We're inverting the client relationship here. So traditionally, if readers were clients, we're saying, well, you know, if we want readers to be able to get it for free, then actually we're providing services to authors. That comes with other social reconfigurations because it might skew what you do. Um, if you don't care about readers, is there a problem for you as a publisher? But nonetheless, Making it a service to authors implies that authors, institutions, or their funders should pay. <coughs> Not a problem in itself, but what it really does is concentrate costs. And think about it like this. Subscriptions do one thing really, really well. They spread the cost of a publisher's labor, surplus, and profit across many institutions. No one institution is paying the total cost for a publisher, well, ideally, um, of the labor and effort that went into publishing an article or even a journal. What we've said is, if lots of people pay that, we have enough centrally to do all our work, make our surplus or profit. But article processing charges don't have that distribution factor. What they say is that the producer will be entirely liable for this. And this is a pretty dire projection of some UK English department budgets and what they look like for a subscription period over a five yearly rate versus article processing charges for the volume that UK researchers are asked to produce for our national funding assessment exercise. So every researcher has to produce four pieces for submission to our national level framework every five years. So I've modeled it against a five year subscription rate here. And some institutions have a budget that is incredibly low. Some have those that are much higher but still far lower than in the scientific disciplines. But what we see in this uh, rough back of the envelope type graph is that actually for all institutions except the biggest institutions, if you flipped it all tomorrow and they still didn't have to pay subscriptions, it's more expensive for all institutions except the bigger ones. Now that assumes an even distribution. I'm just talking about their four outputs. What we actually know as well though is that bigger institutions produce more research. And so actually if we reconfigured our entire research funding ecosystem to accommodate this, we would concentrate publication funding at research-intensive institutions at the top, even while we have ongoing discourses worldwide about increasing the mobility of institutions, allowing younger institutions to break into the research-intensive space because they have pockets of excellence. But if we're denying them the right to publication because we've concentrated costs, we're losing that competitive mobility that comes up in so many fields and we claim we want. So slightly problematic there. Plus the fact that actually in the humanities, all this is locked into subscriptions anyway. There's no transition at the library budget level. All we've seen is some additional funder injections in certain cases that makes it possible to pay these. I would be laughed out of my dean's office, actually, if I tried to get £1,700 to publish an article open access. Um, we'll give it to a PhD student instead would be the better answer there. And then we have the issue that monographs or books are really important in humanities disciplines. Um, I could go down the cynical route and say, yes, we call them the gold standard because actually they're the gold standard, meaning 
you use them as that gold standard of currency for your own promotion. But actually, there are benefits in books. They give you a space to argue for things that can't be done in an 8,000-word article. But the economics and social conditions of book production for publishers are completely different to journals. I mean, one really good example of this is um, think about how we buy books versus how we buy journals. With a journal, we look at how it was doing in the past, and we say, I'd like to subscribe for the next year on the basis that in the past it's published good work that was valued by our scholars. We don't know the precise contents in advance of what's coming that year. Now, that means that publishers took an initial risk with starting a journal, but actually once it's up and running, it's kind of de-risked for publishers as long as people are continuing to subscribe and it's working because it's a payment for the next year's subscription, not what was published last year. Books, at the moment, the risk is entirely with publishers. You have to take on a book. You have to commission it. You have to anticipate its sales volume. You have to go through all the process and produce it and then hope that libraries, in conjunction with researchers, will say, we want that book. So you can't even get the kind of offsetting of double, to um, mitigate against double dipping that we claim in the uh, journal space because there's no pivot point. People are just producing these things and offering them, and a subset get bought. Some publishers do better than others in that space. But it's the kind of social perception there that makes it quite difficult to envisage how supply-side payment with any distribution mechanism could work there. We also have the fact that books are often tr crossover publications into the trade space. Um, actually, as a po if you're a popular historian, the best way to get broad readership is not necessarily to do a green deposit of your book. It's to make sure your book is in the window of Barnes & Noble, um, that you have your TV show and maybe radio tie-in, um, that you're intensely famous, and that people can buy your book in paperback at a decent price. Because the general readers also want those quality signals, and where books end up is a signal of quality. Did the bookshop think it was worth my time is a signal that people value. So books sit in quite an awkward space. Book processing charges for monographs scale incredibly badly. They're sustainable at the current rate that the Wellcome Trust will pay them. So the Wellcome Trust is pretty much the only funder in the world with, with a very strong open access book mandate. And they've essentially said, we'll pay what is asked. So you have figures from uh, Palgrave up to 11,000 UK pounds, so that's about $17,000. Um, down to Ubiquity Press at the £5,050 mark. Um, I've taken Ubiquity Press's higher figure here because it includes comparable services to the other providers, including copy editing, etc. So in the UK, there were 5,023 monographs produced in the UK in 2013 by the largest four publishers. I've also tracked this down that over the last five years, UK researchers submitted around 5,400 books to that exercise. So actually, we can take these as closely comparable figures. And what you see is that at the lowest figure, we've got a 25 million pound cost to the UK in isolation if we went with Ubiquity Press tomorrow and flipped all our book publications to an open access mode on a book processing charge. At the Palgrave price, we come up to 55 million pounds to publish all of the UK's output. Um, per year. But the UK library spend on all books, including textbooks, uh, trade books, fiction in academic libraries through Sconal, was only 60 million. And this system doesn't get rid of the fact, even if you flipped it all tomorrow at a national level, that we have to buy books from abroad. It operates in a global context. And it's very diff difficult to say how you get that budget to be paying from the supply side for books in any way. And here's a nice little chart of that once more. So the gap between the blue bar and the other bars shows what you've got in leeway for any kind of transition on an international scale, any kind of global purchasing move there. So books strike me as something that's going to take a very long time if we ever get there. Although I do want to point out that the studies we have so far of books and open access show that if you make a book open access, you see increased sales, or at least increased traffic to the publisher's website. Um, there is evidence of sales increase. But that's only in the present moment. And that's because the codex, the material book, is still the best way to read 80,000 words. I think I'd have a, a severe headache if every day I tried to read a scholarly monograph on a backlit screen. Um, it's also the case that in our teaching practice, we need sequential and random access and the codex is the best thing at providing that. So print's not dead. 
But keep your eyes out for the person developing the thing that does kill print, that is as good as print, because that's when this economic landscape shifts radically and the demand for digital books goes through the roof while print goes off the radar and then the thinking about the digital becomes problematic for the economics here and the change has to happen. Open access in the humanities still has a long way to go. It's absolutely clear that there are benefits. Um, arguments against open access in the humanities have mostly been on the grounds of practical implementation. We don't have the funding. We can't see how we transition ourselves onto this model. But fundamentally, most people don't argue with the idea that it would be brilliant to disseminate our work openly online and that this would increase the number of readers. But the internet is not going away. These practical problems, if we think industry is the solution for publishing, should be broached by industry, and they should be thought about early, and they should be thought about in a spirit of experimentation. No one single business model is going to do this, and trying one business model and then saying it wasn't possible is not going to wash, because the internet is not going away, as I've said. So thinking about ways in which pilot studies can be done with your collections would be a prudent move, because the second that mandates are introduced, researcher behavior will change, and there will be customer demand for it. So start to imagine what that demand looks like, and think about how, in non-damaging ways, at quantities that can work within your organization, this might work, and you can see a path there. That's pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, there are lots of projects doing interesting things in this space. Um, there are still lots of violent arguments about open access, about these practices. But I hope that that kind of narrative of going back to why we do this through to the challenges, uh, it's been a bit of a pessimistic decline narrative, I guess, because I started off with all the benefits and then came to why it's virtually impossible. Um, but if you don't think the impossible, it, the impossible will never become possible. So my challenge is, Please start thinking about this and think of the humanities as first-class citizens in this ecosystem. They're smaller, but often they're the afterthought, and that decreases their reach. But I don't think there's been a more important time for history and culture to be studied in our contemporary world. And publishers have a vital role in playing, in amplifying that work, in ensuring its reach, in ensuring the public reception of the types of knowledge they produce in these disciplines. Thank you. Again, time for perhaps one or two questions. Uh, anybody has, has one? Sorry, did I? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Mark. I would suggest that a good researcher and writer does get paid for reading. Uh, the work, it might be a second order effect, as we physicists might say, but it, obviously the work gets better the more that the writer has read and it does reflect back. Is that not so? Yes, but on the other hand, there's a paradigm of accelerationism. You're encouraged to produce lots and lots of work, and that implicitly works against lots and lots of reading. Because reading does take time. And if you're saying that there's a, a, a volume that we expect people to produce, that conditions the time that they can spend reading. So absolutely, yes. And of course, researchers do read a lot. But there is a perverse incentive system that works against it that I find fascinating and odd. I, mean, I can't imagine what a research assessment paradigm that did value reading would look like. But it isn't one that quantifies output and insists on material being produced at set points. Because surely, the best work would be work that was as near to comprehensive as a researcher could get it a researcher who had synthesized vast bodies of information and brought critical judgment to bear on it, not someone who just hit the deadlines of the, paradox, of the assessment exercise. So, um, I mean, um, <coughs> sorry, so uh, uh, Carol, um, um, sorry, so um, Don King and Carol Tenapier have done uh, lots of studies of, of researchers uh, reading articles. Are there any comparable studies of, 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 of in the humanities on monographs? Um, I don't know, and it would be really interesting to get a bibliographic database of citations in monographs, but that is actually a really under-researched field. So one, one, how much stuff is cited and how it's cited in any kind of ontology fashion. But then also, I don't know how researchers behave when they're reading. We have those great studies of how people look at things differently on screens and what the digital environment does, but I don't think that's ever been applied to humanities research as a specific demographic. So that would be good to know, and um, how's it changing? 
what are these paradigms of production? How is that making researchers behave differently? I don't know. I can just do that kind of rhetorical question gesture back to that. But yeah, absolutely. I'll figure it out. Um, any other questions? I was interested in your um, comment about price sensitivity, the researchers lacking price sensitivity. So is, is it enough that librarians and libraries are in the real market and are aware of the prices, or is there, should researchers become price sensitive, and if so, like how would that happen? Researchers were suddenly given price sensitivity when article processing charges first came in, and they went ballistic. It was, oh my God, my right to speak is being withdrawn because I don't have access to this funding. When actually most APCs are calculated, obviously, on a business logic inside that says, well, this is how much we hope to make from this at an optimal level, and we'll flip it. So it was an exposure of that. Um, and the logic in lots of studies of APCs was that if we flipped it tomorrow, it would be fine because we've got enough money in the system to pay for everything we're publishing at the moment. But... The kind of utopian hope that proponents of that model had that research would develop price sensitivity went out the window because actually the symbolic economy overrides it. So think of uh, trainers, sneakers, shoes, whatever you call them. Um, people buy Nike trainers regardless of whether they're the same as non-brand trainers because actually uh, they want the cultural capital, the cool factor of having the right shoes. And actually I think for researchers... What service is provided is completely secondary to the brand value it gives within their assessment paradigms, I'm sorry to say. And that's not to say that publishers don't do things differently and in different ways that are better or worse. It's just to say that pub, uh, motivation of authors is uh, driven by different factors. So a great example of this is that there was a recent study where pub researchers were moaning about marketing efforts of certain publishers with whom they were working. I'm not going to name anyone here. Um, but it didn't stop them continuing to go there. They weren't caring that the service wasn't what they'd like and that other places might provide it better. What they still thought was, well, my peers who are assessing me will look at that and see it on a CV and it will do the assessment function for me. So price sensitivity won't develop in that kind of culture until researchers care about what publishers are doing and can do better for them. And, you know, lots of publisher marketing is, is focusing on this. You know, we, will, we will do additional video interviews. We will have these add-on services. But they're always secondary at the moment for in the eyes of researchers. Okay, well, I think that probably wraps it up, and I think uh, people are eager to go and get champagne, but so please.